He is one of the most successful recording artists of the 21st century. Justin was a natural performer. At the age of 10, he was already singing at the world famous Grand Ole Opry in Tennessee. People really started to take note of his incredible talent. From the Mickey Mouse Club to NSYNC, Justin Timberlake has gone on to become an international superstar as a solo artist. Justin's solo album was something that we all really, really wanted. Justify did really well for him, went straight into the Billboard charts to number two. Um, it was selling millions around the globe. The US megastar has jumped from platform to platform on his way to establishing himself as something bigger than a star, a self-sustained empire. In terms of sheer celebrity power, there is no one bigger in the world right now in terms of male artists than Justin Timberlake. With over 500 million hits on YouTube, Justin Timberlake just may be the quintessential pop star of the new millennium. When Justin won the Lifetime Achievement Award at the 2013 VMAs, I think we really got to grips with who he is as a performer. It was hit after hit after hit. The dance moves were slick. You know, the audience was loving it. His voice was so on point. This is Justin Timberlake's incredible story. The rise of Justin Timberlake has been nothing short of remarkable. The singer, songwriter, actor, and producer has a net worth of an astounding $100 million. Throughout his career, the man from Tennessee has acquired a global fan base of millions. But where did it all begin for the dynamic superstar? Justin was born in Memphis, Tennessee in 1981, raised in very much a middle-class family. Um, his father was the director of the local choir, and I think they realized very early on that he had an amazing voice and a big talent. And of course, Justin, being such a talented singer at such a young age, would often go along and sing in church with him, and it was obvious at that point how talented he was. It was obvious from a very early age that Justin was an extremely talented youngster, but when he was just five years of age, he had to go through the painful process of his parents getting divorced. It's hard for any child to go through their parents splitting up, and Justin was just five when his got divorced. It obviously hugely affected him when he was growing up, but still, he's got such a close bond with his mother and often says that she is his best friend. Justin's spoken quite openly about the fact that him and his mother are very, very close. His parents divorced when he was just five years old. Um, and I think he's obviously kept the relationship with the mother a lot stronger than what it is with the father. Despite going through a tough time in his personal life, Justin continued to do what he loved, perform. And at the age of 11, he appeared on a TV talent show Star Search. At the age of 11, Justin went to Hollywood where he performed in Star Search. It was kind of like a kid's version of X Factor and Pop Idol, and he was starting to make a really big impression. He was always performing the country songs. He wasn't doing all of the slick, you know, sexy back dance moves. It was a very different Justin in those days. Star Search, which is basically the same as Pop Idol and X Factor, and he performed under the name of Justin Randall, which is quite funny because that was his father's first name who inspired him to take up singing. Unfortunately, Justin didn't win Star Search, but appearing on the show did wonders for his confidence. Although Justin didn't win Star Search, what it did was give him the confidence. It got him used to the fact of, you know, being in the studios, performing, taking a bit of criticism, you know, and really trying to fight to get to where he wanted to go. Justin, over here, please. Justin. While Justin didn't win Star Search, the confidence he could get from performing and being told how great he was was amazing for him. What Star Search did was put him in front of the American public and show that he was a great performer and someone that they, that they all had to watch out for in the future. In 1993, Justin was cast as a member of the hit TV show, The Mickey Mouse Club, 
And it was on this show where he would meet future stars such as Christina Aguilera, Ryan Gosling, and Britney Spears. It was also where Justin would meet his future NSYNC band member, J.C. Chazez. In 1993, Justin signed up for the Mickey Mouse Club, an iconic TV show founded by, of course, Walt Disney. It ran for 50 odd years. It was the home to the likes of Britney Spears, Ryan Gosling, Christina Aguilera, and of course, Mr. Timberlake. Justin's big break came in 1993 when he landed a part on the Mickey Mouse Club. It was Disney's big brand show. He was with a load of other stars, including Britney, Christina Aguilera, Ryan Gosling, and it's also where he met one of his new bandmates in NSYNC, JC Chazé. And while there were so many talents there, it was actually JC Chazes who we ended up founding NSYNC with, who Justin got on with the most. After Justin's time on the Mickey Mouse Club came to an end, he asked fellow cast member JC Chazes if he wanted to start a boy band. And not long after came the birth of NSYNC. When Justin's run in uh, Mickey Mouse Club came to an end in 95, he got together with JC Chazé and Lou Palmer and basically said, do you want to make a boy band? Um, eventually they did get, they got onto the likes of Chris, Joey and Lance, um, and they all got together and formed that band. I think, yeah, I think you'll see us, you know, start to do a lot of different things, but we are a vocal group and we will always, you know, remain within music. Justin found help from Lou Pearlman, who was of course the boy band extraordinaire, and Chris Kirkpatrick, the talented musician. They rounded up other bandmates, Joey and Lance, and moved to Florida where they started incredible rehearsals and relentless dance work routines. Lou Perlman had obviously managed a lot of other boy bands in the past. Um, he put them all together in a house in Florida, got them rehearsing, got them working together, and really started to gel them together as a boy band. I think we want to show people that we want to do this for a long time, that we want to be known as not just a group who put out one or two albums. We want to be around for five or six. Shortly after the formation of the band, Lou Pearlman hired Johnny Wright, former manager of the Backstreet Boys, to manage NSYNC. Having the former manager of the Backstreet Boys working alongside them would have been a huge confidence booster for the five boys. In late 1995, Lou Pearlman was so confident he had a group of stars, he approached the manager of the Backstreet Boys, Johnny Wright. He was the manager of the Backstreet Boys at the time. This was obviously a huge deal for NSYNC. They had the guy that was basically managing the biggest boy band in the world at the time. So they knew that they were on to a winner. They knew they had to impress him because he wasn't just going to take them on for any good reason. They had to work their butts off. They had to sing good, they had to dance, they had to really form the gel of a boy band before he'd even consider taking them on. For the land of the free. Boys performed for him at a showcase. He was so impressed, he signed them up to his massive European label. After going in to perform a showcase for Johnny Wright, uh, the boys really impressed him. He immediately signed them, um, and two days later, just two days after they signed, they were already signed to BMG Areola Munich, which is a massive label in Europe, so Germany, where the Backstreet Boys were already a huge success. Now that NSYNC were signed to a massive European label, they began the process of recording their first album. Johnny Wright definitely made it a priority right from the get-go that NSYNC had to record with really good people, solid producers. They all went over to Sweden, started working with the best in the business. They weren't mucking about with the release of this band. NSYNC were flown to Sweden to record their debut album. They worked with some massive European producers. They produced the biggest hits in the music scene. They were just teenagers and they gave up everything to go and pursue their dreams. And I think you've got to remember that as boys, they were teenagers, you know, they were really young, flying all around the world, starting to become big icons, and they were going to miss their families, you know, they had a lot to learn, had to find their feet on being away from everyone that they'd grown up with. With the boys now in Europe recording their first major album, it was vital that their first single was a success. And with the release of I Want You Back, the boys became an overnight sensation throughout Europe. It was massive 
massively important. The boys got off to a perfect start with their debut single, and that's what they did. I Want You Back was first released in Germany, and the crowd and the fans loved it. It was on all of the music channels. Everyone was loving their dance moves. It was exactly what the boys needed. It was very important from the get-go that NSYNC released the right single. I Want You Back was that perfect European pop song. They went to Germany first. We kind of owe it to the Germans that they got them off the ground. But Europe followed. They started to hit all of the top tens around Europe and America was just waiting for NSYNC to start there. Boys' album topped the German charts. They began touring other German-speaking countries and they became an overnight sensation. With a successful European release of their debut album, the boys were ready to take on the US. They were signed up to RCA Records after capturing the attention of an executive who represented the American record label. They'd cracked Europe. They conquered the continent, but what they really wanted was to break America. And after one performance in Budapest, they wowed a rep, the biggest scout from a huge American record label, Vincent DiGiorgio, who signed them in 98 to RCA Records. And that was where they really started to become world superstars. After a performance in Budapest, um, NSYNC was spotted by an RCA record label representative, um, and he knew that he was onto a winner and that these boys definitely need to be signed in America quickly snapped them up and the rest is history. After the boys signed to RCA Records, they went on to release their self-titled album in America and it was a proud moment for the young superstars. It was a really proud moment for NSYNC when they could finally release their self-titled debut album in the US. They re-recorded a few songs to appeal to the market and their first single, I Want You Back, hit number 13 in the Billboard charts. In 1998, NSYNC started to make waves in America. They released I Want You Back, it got to number 13 in the Billboard chart. NSYNC did have to be slightly careful because they had a very European sound. So a few tracks were reworked, rejigged, and re-recorded just for the American market. Despite I Want You Back performing well in the US charts, the album wasn't faring so well. A real turning point came for the band when they were asked to perform on the Disney Channel in place of the Backstreet Boys. The biggest turning point for the band was when they covered for the Backstreet Boys on a Disney Channel special performance. The Backstreet Boys were meant to perform but had to pull out last minute due to ill health of one of their members. The real turning point was when they performed for the Disney Channel. They did a special gig um, and whereas they were 85 before in the charts, they suddenly got propelled to number 9. And they blew the crowd out of the water. After that, they didn't look back. Their album, number nine in the charts, just three weeks after. It was this performance that put them on the map. The boys were starting to acquire millions of fans across America. And at a time when they should have been focusing solely on their music, the band entered a legal battle with the man who started it all off for the boys, Lou Pearlman. But 1998 wasn't that easy for NSYNC. They entered a massive legal battle with Lou Pearlman. He's supposed to be taking one sixth of their profits, but they actually found out that he was taking a lot more. In 1998, they entered a legal battle, very high publicized with their founder, the person who helped them get big, Lou Pearlman. They alleged that he was taking more than 50% of the earnings when it was previously agreed that he was only meant to take one sixth. And now, while it was shocking, eventually the pair agreed to settle out of court. Eventually, they parted company, it was all settled out of court, and they signed with Jive Records. Back and listen to it again, and really... With their legal woes behind them, the band moved on to bigger and better things. They went on to record their second studio album, No Strings Attached, which ultimately led the five boys onto their groundbreaking success as a boy band. Now it's time uh, for us to go for long term. We're going to be here for a while, uh, for years to come. We're going to grow with our fans, uh, you know, always do the music they want to do. We're never going to, like, you know, fall off the face of the earth for, you know, two years like a lot of groups do. Uh, but we're going to, you know, stay in touch with our fans, see what they want us to do. NSYNC went on to release their second studio album, No Strings Attached. And now this catapulted them into the world of stardom and celebrity. They were no longer these pinups for teenage girls. They had a more R&B sound to it. What's the title? No strings attached. What's the significance of that? What's that? What's the significance of that? The significance of that? 
significance is, um, I think just that we're more or less coming into our own um, as musicians and showing people that, you know, I mean, you come out with, a, with one album and everybody's, you know, if you get a lot of hype around it, then there's a lot of pressure on you for your second album. Second studio album for NSYNC was where everything changed. No strings attached was a huge pop record. Two and a half million copies were sold in the States alone. And it still remains one of the biggest Amazon all time bestsellers. Uh, this album is going to be incredible. We're, we're doing a lot of collaborations on it. Uh, well, more than the last album for sure. But uh, we're doing collaborations on this album. We're producing some stuff ourselves and writing some more stuff ourselves. It's going to be more, it's going to be definitely an album way more influenced by the group right here. They were really competing with the Backstreet Boys. It was massive, a real classic boy band album. By the end of the year, it sold 10 million copies. I think No Strings Attached is just, you know, we feel like we feel like there's nothing that can really hold us back from there's doing no that. There's no puppet master yeah. behind us. Well, That's we just feel like we feel like there's nothing that can hold us back from doing what we love to do. No Strings Attached went on to be a hugely successful album for NSYNC selling millions of copies all around the world. The album featured the hit single, Bye Bye Bye, which is often noted as the band's signature song. Bye 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 was NSYNC's big song from No Strings Attached. It kind of encapsulated everything that the band were about. It's very high energy, Dance music was brilliant. One of the most defining moments for the band was when they released a trademark single, Bye Bye Bye. It became their signature track and the dance moves were a phenomenon. It was edgy, upbeat, and it really put them in the Everest of celebrity. It's really special. I mean, we came out last March and everything's just been blazing since we came out. And it's, you could ask, you know, why do you think that's happening? But I don't think any of us can really explain this right here. It's just, all we can say is that it's an We honor. have the best fans in the entire yeah. world. Yeah. After the successful release of Bye Bye Bye, NSYNC went on to release their second single, It's Gonna Be Me, which went on to become their first US number one hit. NSYNC's next single, It's Gonna Be Me, was the big breaking point for them. It was the number one hit on the Billboard chart in America. It was definitely that great pop song that everyone wanted. NSYNC landed their first ever US number one with It's Gonna Be Me. It had a brilliant pop video. It was a fantastic tune. In the video for It's Gonna Be Me, it was incredible. They were their own figurines in a supermarket, and instead of them being chased around by the female fans, it worked the other way around. They were trying to fight for the love of an unknown shopper, and it meant that people were watching the entire thing growing to know NSYNC if they weren't already familiar. At this point in their careers, NSYNC were international superstars, and after the success of their second album, they embarked on the No Strings Attached World Tour and managed to sell out arenas all around the world. NSYNC's No Strings Attached Tour was definitely a turning point for them. It kind of took them from being this pop band to being international global pop sensations. So the year is 2000 and the whole world is obsessed with pop music. NSYNC are the biggest boy band in the world. They're one of the biggest pop acts in the world. In the UK and the US, all over Europe, Asia and Australia going crazy for these five lads. So of course they released the No Strings Attached album which sells uh, nearly two and a half million copies in its first week of release so therefore the record label Jive Records and their management knew the boys had to go out and tour this record, which obviously went on to become one of the best-selling albums of that decade. Uh, so as soon as NSYNC announced that they would tour the world with the No Strings Attached World Tour, uh, demand for tickets went through the roof. Every radio station in America, every TV outlet, everyone, every media outlet, every press, everyone wanted to talk about the fact that NSYNC were going on tour and the demand was huge. These arenas sold out. 
within, I think, an hour in most cities. The demand was that massive. They had to add constant dates. And it also meant that they toured and visited countries they'd never been to before. And they were able to go back to Europe and assert their authority as one of the biggest bands in the world. After NSYNC had toured the world, become one of the most successful boy bands of all time, fans and critics were starting to wonder if Justin was becoming the standout member of the group. It was very clear after the No Strings Attached tour that Justin was the standout member of the band. I think it was after the uh, No Strings Attached world tour had kicked in when management and the record label had got to see the NSYNC show and also watched the reaction from the fans in the arenas. And it was pretty obvious that the one member of the band getting the loudest cheers uh, and the biggest amount of noise and screams from the thousands of teenage girls was Justin Timberlake. He was getting more airtime, he was in the videos more, he was lead vocalist, he was writing a lot more. And by then, he had started to assert his authority and assert the fact that, you know, he was an extremely talented member of this band. This man could do it all, he could sing, he could dance, he could also write as well. He was starting to uh, go into studio, work on his own material, and he was already planning his baby steps towards a solo career. He just gelled all the other boys together. Um, and it was obvious that Justin was going to carry on on his own, no matter what was going to happen. But it was so obvious that for everybody in the, uh, watching that arena show, Justin had a few moments where his, the spotlight was solely on him. Uh, Michael Jackson at the time was reaching out to him as well, was asking for meetings with Justin. It was obvious that his destiny was to be a solo artist. In early 2000, the news broke that Justin Timberlake was dating Britney Spears. Britney was the biggest female pop artist at the time. Their relationship further enhanced Justin's status as the standout member of NSYNC. Justin and Britney were Hollywood's hottest couple. There was only one relationship that everyone was talking about in 2000, 2001. Every magazine, every newspaper, uh, the early days of the internet, gossip websites, showbiz websites wanted to talk about two people, Justin Timberlake and Britney Spears. Justin obviously met Britney when they were on the Mickey Mouse Club uh, back in the day, but when they were dating, it was like a whole new level of fame. They were the uber pop couple. They were the most famous couple in the world. I mean, these kids had obviously known each other since they were kids, since they were 12 years, 13 years old, working at the Disney Club. And here they were as two of the biggest uh, recording artists in the world on the same record label with the same management team, uh, with the same entourage, close posters. It was all beautiful. It was all perfect. You know, the papers were covering it on the front, on the front. They were being followed everywhere. They were on red carpets. They were your you know, typical Hollywood couple that you wanted to know everything about. They look so blooming cute as well, those white teeth and everyone wanting a bit of them. Um, and it was one of those relationships you never wanted to end. But the whole thing, the relationship, Justin and Britney catapulted both of them, especially Justin, into the celebrity stratosphere. It was their moment and the whole world was obsessed with Spears and Timberlake. Justin was no longer one fifth of NSYNC. He was definitely a star within his own right. Whilst Justin had been making all the headlines with his relationship with Britney, NSYNC were back in the studio to record their third album, Celebrity. In 2001, NSYNC released Celebrity. It was their third album. It's kind of a different direction. Nelly and Timbaland were involved. It's very R&B. It wasn't your typical European pop like we've been used to. If you go back to 2001, you may remember that the world of music was dominated really by hip hop and R&B, but it was obvious by this, by halfway through 2001, that pop, R&B, hip hop was the way to go. Pure pop, the pop uh, music of 98, 99, where we first discovered Britney and Justin Timberlake, that was dying off a little bit. Kids wanted something a little bit cooler, and then this was really being led by the USA, as is often the case. And with NSYNC, obviously, they'd had two pure pop, explosive albums. They had to follow up No Strings Attached with another multi-platinum number one album. They issued the album Celebrity, but as I mentioned, the backdrop to the album was the fact that the band wanted to contribute more songwriters. They were working with cooler producers. They started to dabble with different musicians. They were trying to engineer a new sound, and that's what they, I think they achieved with this album. It was cool, it was credible, it was still pop, but it was certainly a step forward. It was fresh, and I think in the case of Justin Timberlake, it was the sound of things to come. Didn't quite do as well as what it had done before as well. 
and you could see that Justin was getting a lot more involved with the direction of the band. The album was noted for its different musical sound to previous NSYNC albums. It featured elements of hip-hop and R&B. This change in musical direction was evident in the single Girlfriend. I think when Girlfriend was released, we started to realize just how much influence Justin was having over the band. You know, even when you look back at it now, it does sound like a Justin Timberlake song. Um, it did do well, and it's one of those songs that is remembered. Are you sure that it's real? Are you sure? I remember when I first heard the NSYNC single Girlfriend, I remember being a radio DJ on, on air and being given this record by Sony Music and said, look, play this record, it's going to be a huge hit. American radio had already gone crazy for it, and as soon as I heard it, I realized that this pop urban track with the slight, slight sort of Southern Tennessee vibe throughout it as well, you know, due to Justin Timberlake's background, it was a credible pop record. It was an instant number one in America. It got to number two, I think, here in the UK. But it was such a clever record embracing uh, the growth of pop, hip hop, and urban sounds throughout mainstream America and obviously fusing it with NSYNC style. And also, the video was ridiculously cool, ridiculously credible. It got high rotation across the world. This record had to work, and I still think it's one of NSYNC's finest singles. NSYNC's third album, Celebrity, was to be their last. Shortly after the release of the album, the band announced that they would be going on a hiatus. Fans and music critics started to speculate that the boys had gone their separate ways. Like all good things, NSYNC did have to come to an end, and I think Justin obviously wanted to start making his way down to a solo career. You know, so did JC Jose in the band as well. But um, they kind of went on a hiatus, didn't really tell anyone what was happening, and just dispersed amongst our very eyes. Now, even though NSYNC's Celebrity album, their third album, I thought was a very credible pop record, um, it didn't quite connect with fans, it didn't quite sell the numbers they were hoping for, it didn't match the 10 million sales and no strings attached uh, achieved two years previously. So we get to 2002, and even though there was, there was no official announcement, there was no emotional breakup, no press conference, no press release, it was obvious that NSYNC would go in their separate ways. Justin Timberlake had made uh, so many noises and had reached out to so many producers and other artists and talked about performing as a solo artist. He was dabbling with duets and collaborations. He was spending time in studio with Timberland. JC Chazay, with his incredible voice, went on to do his own solo album, but it was obvious that NSYNC had come to an end. Like all boy bands do, they only have a short pop life. But after that, from that moment from 2002, it really was all about JT, the solo star. After the breakup of NSYNC, Justin was once again filling up pages in showbiz magazines all around the world, this time with the news that he and Britney had split up. Well, when Justin was with Britney Spears, this was his first love. So when they did split up, just shortly after NSYNC had been on their hiatus, it was a big shock. The news that Justin and Britney Spears had called it a day and split up was a massive showbiz story. I mean, you have to remember they were the most photographed couple in the world. They were the most talked about couple in celebrity. Every magazine, every newspaper carried this story. And of course, there were an awful lot of young female fans who were thinking, yes, Justin Timberlake is mine. He's finally a single man. I mean, there were rumors that Britney Spears wasn't interested in talking about family or marriage. Justin uh, believes in marriage, he believes in family, and he, I think, wanted to embrace that world. There were talks of junior Justin's and baby Britney's. It wasn't meant to be. And I think the split affected Britney more than Justin. I think that's been well documented in the last 10 years, what she's gone through in her private life. I think Justin seized the moment. He relished the opportunity to reinvent himself. He was a single man and also a man uh, engaged in a solo career. He wanted to be a worldwide solo star. It was on the front pages all around the world. Everybody was gossiping about it, wanting to know the ins and outs. You know, and at the, at the center of it, Justin had lost the girl that he loved. After coming through a rough patch in his personal life, it was time for Justin to launch his solo career. 
His first solo album was titled Justified and included hit single Crimea River. Crimea River, quite simply, is the standout track on the Justified album. It was an incredible, huge number one hit around the world. I mean, it's still the song that fans expect Justin to perform wherever he tours now. It still sounds fresh, some 12 years on. It's still an incredibly clever pop R&B record. It had that great Timbaland groove and production. To say that you did, I already know. And of course, we now know that the song was inspired by his breakup with Britney Spears. He's been on record now, he's admitted that the song was his response to that emotional split. And of course, we got a mysterious half naked woman in the shower in the iconic video and everybody assumed it was Britney Spears. It was quite a revelation, it was quite a story. It's still an amazing pop record all these years on. Crimey River was obviously a huge hit to come from Justified. It was rumored to be about his split with Britney Spears. And I think we'd all love to, you know, think about the fact that Justin had thrown all of his problems in his personal life into his music. It was a global hit as well, and it's one that's still played everywhere you go. Justin's solo career got off to a fantastic start with Justified. The album was hugely popular amongst fans all around the world and went on to sell millions of copies. There was literally a media frenzy anticipating Justin Timberlake's solo album, Justified. Justin's solo album was something that we all really, really wanted. Justified did really well for him, went straight into the Billboard charts to number two. Um, it was selling millions around the globe, three million in the US, one million elsewhere. He mastered a unique pop R&B sound that was you need to hear him. It borrowed heavily from other performers, especially Michael Jackson, who apparently had turned down many of the records that he ended up recording for the album. It was definitely critically well received as well. He'd made a really good point that he could stand alone and not have to be one of five people. And so it was no surprise that when Justify was finally released, uh, he had an incredible first week sales, leading to a US number one album, uh, a multi-platinum number one album in the UK and across Europe. He got the sound right, he was working with the right people. This was Justin's moment to shine. Justified was heavily praised by music critics for its unique and diverse sound. It seemed that Justin had moved away from the typical pop sound of NSYNC. Hip-hop and R&B producers such as Timbaland and the Neptunes worked on the album, and it helped to give it a sound that would appeal to a larger fan base. Justin was very clever with Justify because what he did by getting Timberland involved was open his doors to a new audience. He'd been incredibly clever and uh, used his time, his previous 12 months, to spend time in studio with the Neptunes, with Pharrell, with Timberland. You know, the R&B folk, maybe an older audience as well, that wouldn't necessarily have listened to him in NSYNC. In 2003, Justin started dating Hollywood A-lister Cameron Diaz. The couple were photographed on a daily basis and featured in magazines all around the world. They were the latest couple to be taking Hollywood by storm. We first got rumors that Cameron Diaz and Justin Timberlake might be more than just friends after they celebrated at an after show party at the Nickelodeon Kids Choice Awards in Los Angeles. They'd both been uh, on stage presenting at the show. They'd also been covered in green slime. So they had something to bond over, but there'd been rumors uh, circulating for a while that the two were socializing, they knew each other, they had mutual friends as well in the industry. You kind of would have thought after Justin took going out with Britney that he wouldn't have gone out with another high profile person. But in 2003, Cameron Diaz came along and it became his next Hollywood girl. They were out on the red carpet, you know, they were quite fiercely private during their time together, but it was a great tabloid story. Everybody wanted to know the ins and outs. 
And let's be honest, Cameron Diaz was one of Hollywood's leading ladies right then. She was hot property. She was uh, one of the highest paid women in Hollywood, one of the sexiest women in Hollywood. It was no surprise that Justin and Cameron had become an item. The question was, how long would it last? In 2004, Justin was asked to perform at the Super Bowl halftime show alongside Janet Jackson. Major controversy was to follow, as at the end of their performance, Justin ripped off the top half of Janet's costume, leaving her exposed, and a media storm was about to ensue. In 2004, it was the first time that we kind of seen controversy go wrong with Justin's career, when he was performing at the Super Bowl with Janet Jackson. <laughs> The Justin Timberlake, Janet Jackson Super Bowl moment is one of those moments in TV history everyone has seen and everyone to this day still talks about. It's one of the most watched clips on YouTube and it's one of the most litigious pieces of television in American history. the record number of complaints that the uh, federal authorities received, the TV broadcasters were fined millions of pounds. Janet Jackson ultimately suffered, her career suffered because of this one ridiculous decision to have Justin Timberlake rip off her leather bodice, exposing her right uh, nipple, which was studded with a star. Song. I mean, what a crazy decision, but what an incredible piece of TV. They apparently didn't do it in rehearsal, but when it came to the live shot, he went and grabbed her top and the boob fell out and America was outraged. There were hundreds and hundreds of complaints um, and people did want him to apologize for what he'd done. Thank you. Nipplegate was making headlines all over the world. And after the hugely controversial moment, Justin was made to publicly apologize. The moment that Justin Timberlake ripped off uh, part of Janet Jackson's costume. I mean, I remember watching it live thinking, did that just happen? Has he damaged her, her costume in front of millions of viewers? I mean, what a horrendous moment. But of course, as we subsequently learned, oh no, the choreography had been changed and Janet Jackson knew exactly what she was doing. She wanted an incredible moment of TV. Well, unfortunately, that moment backfired. It really damaged Janet Jackson's career. And at that time, Justin Timberlake's people, his management and his record label were also panicking. He was one of the hottest music stars in the world. And with a Grammy nomination in the bag, coming in a matter of weeks, another huge American broadcast, uh, Justin Timberlake was told, if you don't apologize, no Grammy, no performance on the big iconic TV show. But unfortunately, the Janet Jackson incident was taken very seriously in America. At the time, he was actually up for best Grammy for best male. Um, and they did say, unless he apologized for what he'd done on stage by exposing the breast, then he wouldn't have been able to have gone to the Grammys and picked up an award. He had too much to lose. Justin Timberlake issued a rather groveling apology. Uh, but Janet Jackson, on the other hand, of course, declined. She refused to apologize. Uh, she refused to bow down to the right wing press. Janet Jackson, on the other hand, refused to apologize. And actually, the relationship between Justin and Janet, you have to remember, Justin was great friends at that time with her brother, Michael. He was a, revered the Jacksons, loved Janet. Their relationship suffered, and they've hardly spoken since that moment. In late 2004, Justin decided to take a break from music to focus on his acting career, and was about to star alongside some of Hollywood's biggest actors. In 2004, Justin decided he wanted to spend more time on his acting career, which was quite a punchy move after releasing such a huge album. He went on to get a number of movie roles. His first film was with Morgan Freeman and Kevin Spacey in Edison. And then Justin went on to star alongside Bruce Willis in Alpha Dog. What Justin was cleverly doing was building up a really good repertoire of, you know, being taken as a serious actor, working with the right directors, working with some of the Hollywood's A-list, um, and eventually he was going to become one of them. In 2006, the news broke that Justin and Cameron had split up. 
The couple had been together for two years, and their breakup was huge news across Hollywood. There had been many rumours doing the rounds in Hollywood, in showbiz circles, that things weren't going quite right for Justin Timberlake and Cameron Diaz. Although the couple had spent an amazing three years together and had been photographed everywhere, they'd worked together, they attended every award ceremony together, people were speculating, gossiping that she was the one, Justin Timberlake was finally going to settle down, uh, there would be children, it was the perfect relationship, but it became clear in 2006 that it wasn't the case. Uh, a statement was issued after weeks of speculation declaring that the relationship was over. The couple did indeed confirm that. In 2006, we learned that Cameron and Justin had actually split up. And I think the overwhelming feeling amongst people was, hmm, it's really sad, you know, Justin's heartbroken again. Cameron and Justin initially wouldn't talk about their private life in early interviews, but a few months down the line on the red carpet, I remember Cameron Diaz admitting that she was a solo girl. The tabloids obviously loved it and it was on the front pages again. But you know, could he find someone normal? Could he not just date, you know, Laura down the road that worked in the bakery? But I think it had uh, quite an effect on both of them. Although they've managed to uh, remain friends to this day, apparently they're still good friends, still in touch, and that's a rare thing in Hollywood in 2013. After going through such a public breakup, Justin was back in the studio to record his second solo album, Future Sex Love Sounds, which included the massive hit single, Sexy Back. I'm bringing sexy back. Future Sex Love Sounds immediately started on the right track with Sexy Back. It was the first number one for him in the UK. I'll let you with me if I misbehave. Sexy Back also reached number one on the Billboard Hot 100 in the US. Every club, every DJ, every radio station, every TV channel played one record in 2006, and it was Justin Timberlake's Sexy Back. I mean, the man had struck gold by going back into studio with his best mate, Timberland, who at that moment was still one of the hottest producers in the world. And when he issued that iconic album where it showed him smashing up a giant disco ball, uh, in a suit that covered the Future Sex Love Sounds album. I mean, that was quite a statement from Justin Timberlake. In a way, he was getting rid of his pop persona. He was an edgier, more urban, more credible artist and sexy back. In the end, we all now know it's a pop classic, a very clever record. And the video for Sexy Back was exactly what we wanted to see from the return of Justin Timberlake. You know, the slick dance moves, looking cool, loads of sexy girls. It was just a perfect return in the pop charts. Justin's second solo album was even more successful than his first. It sold over half a million copies in its first week and was highly praised by some of the music industry's most well-respected critics. Music fans and Justin Timberlake fans had waited, what, four years for the follow-up to the number one massive-selling debut album, Justified. I mean, we had waited a long time. It was obvious that Justin wanted to perfect his production, his sound. He wanted to get the right record. He knew he had to get the release right. He had to get the sales numbers high. And he was, again, incredibly clever he struck gold when he issued sexy back as the lead single from the future sex love sounds album the future sex love sounds sold over half a million copies in the states in the first week and shot straight to the top of the billboard charts it was a bit of a marmite record initially radio weren't quite sure what to do with the record it had a very um a grindy sort of dangerous hip-hop edge with some incredible production and beats from timberland but with a very sexy video which portrayed Justin almost in a sort of a James Bond-esque uh, party figure in a tux. It ticked every box. Uh, the sound was right. The record went on to be another huge number one. And in fact, I prefer that album to his first. I think it's a more credible, more creative album. 
Once again, Justin was using all of his R&B and hip hop influences. He's working with Timberland, he had Will I Am on board, Snoop Dogg, T.I. You know, the list went on. He was really expanding what he'd done with his first album into a much broader, more adult audience. Justin went on to release the album's second single, What Goes Around Comes Around. The video features Scarlett Johansson and is widely regarded as one of the greatest music videos of all time. He followed up Sexy Back from his second studio album with What Goes Around Comes Around. What Goes Around Comes Around was also a huge hit for him. It was another number one in the US. And of course the album version was this epic, grandiose piece of music. I mean, it ran at seven and a half minutes long, amazing production from Timberlake, big soaring vocal from Justin, and many fans declared this was the follow-up to Cry Me A River. The video features Scarlett Johansson. It was kind of supposed to be the sequel to the Crimey River video that we'd seen about the Britney breakup. We all speculated, was this song about Cameron Diaz? I'm sure it was, but look at the video. There was Scarlett Johansson looking incredibly beautiful, incredibly sexy. It was like a mini movie. It was like a short film. It was very noir. It was something that could have been a slice of Hollywood, frankly. There were many rumors that him and Scarlett were incredibly close on set. But what it did do is get him an MTV award for Best Direction. It was just perfect. It even won. I think Best Art Direction at the MTV Awards. So, you know, he was getting critical and acclaimed for what he'd done. And it's gone on to be one of Justin Timberlake's greatest selling singles of all time. At this point in his illustrious career, Justin was well known for dating some of Hollywood's hottest stars. And in 2007, he started dating Hollywood actress Jessica Biel. Justin Timberlake's love life could be a movie in itself. I mean, he's dated some of the most famous and some of the sexiest women in the world. In 2007, we started to hear rumors about the fact Justin was dating Jessica Biel another Hollywood actress, so it didn't really come as a surprise that this was happening. But in 2007, he was linked to Hollywood actress Jessica Biel. Again, one of the most sought after actresses in Hollywood, one of the highest paid actresses in Hollywood. Her star was on the ascendancy, and she just happened to be one of the sexiest, most beautiful women in Hollywood at that time as well. It took them quite a long while to actually confirm the relationship, but once they did, it, we kind of fell into that same situation. Britney, Cameron, Jessica, they're all really hot and they're all kind of at the top of their game in Hollywood. Uh, there were rumours that the pair were socialising at many after show parties like the Oscars and apparently at the Golden Globes, but after months of speculation, whispers on the circuit at parties, they finally confirmed they were dating and they started stepping out as a couple. And it looked like this time, Justin Timberlake may have found the perfect woman. It was another dream Hollywood couple for journalists. In 2007, Justin again took some time out from his music career to focus on his acting. Having already starred alongside some of Hollywood's finest actors, the offers came flooding in for the former NSYNC star. So by 2007, we were expecting a new Justin Timberlake album. There were rumors we were gonna get a third solo record. Future Sex, Love Sounds, the tour was an incredible piece of theater. 2007, Justin decided to take time out from music once again to go back to acting. But this time he was kind of doing it with a lot more credibility behind his belt. But it was obvious to all those who knew Justin Timberlake well that he wanted to take a break from music to focus 
on movies. He'd been dabbling in acting since he was a kid. He'd explored opportunities. He'd met with script writers and directors. 2006, seven, of course, he provided the voice in the third Shrek movie. He was back working alongside his ex, Cameron Diaz, when he provided the voice of the character Arthur Pendragon. He'd done all the small roles. Now he really wanted to get his teeth into it. The third Shrek film was his first thing, you know, so he was voicing a character, it was brilliant. But he really struck gold when he was cast as a music industry executive in the award-winning film, The Social Network. But it was speculated on the internet, which is always 115% true, <laughs> um, um, that I was going to be playing the part of Sean Parker in this film. The Facebook story, it became one of the biggest films of the year, and it helped Justin's movie career go to a whole new level. I did draw a lot of um, of what I wanted to bring out of the character from the screenplay, and you know, like Aaron said, it should also be noted that we were working with a masterful filmmaker. But more importantly, the Social Network, which obviously had a lot of people looking at it for Oscars, and Justin was playing the, the supporting actor role. It was a really, really good signing for him, and he was starting to make make the point that he wasn't just you know, the typical pop star that turns actor. I, you know, I spend so much time playing this character, I, I, fi I find a lot of sympathy uh, for Sean's situation in the film. I think they're all going to be okay, but we were telling a story about a moment in time. This isn't a biopic, it's about a moment in time. After the success of The Social Network, Justin was no longer just a musical superstar, but an A-list Hollywood actor. The Social Network really was uh, the big film of 2010. I mean, it really reached out to a whole new young demographic. It was a very cool film, uh, beautifully directed by Aaron Sorkin. It, I mean, it won acclaim. It had Golden Globe, BAFTA, and Oscar nominations. Coming across the screenplay, I think, you know, enough cannot be said about uh, the, you know, what, not to embarrass Aaron, uh, but, but how well and, uh, dazzling the whole screenplay was. But there was Justin Timberlake playing Sean Parker, the man, of course, that helped create Napster and the whole internet phenomena of uh, burning and downloading music. It was quite a fitting role for Justin Timberlake. He knew the music industry. It was a very sassy, cool role. It certainly put him on the map and he delivered a fine performance in the movie, which went on to be a massive worldwide number one hit. After the success of The Social Network, he kind of improved even more and showed us that he could get those big film roles. Huge action film in time with Amanda Seyfried. This role to me was was somebody that I admired and someone that I felt really close to. Um, so I probably put a little more of myself into into the character with this, with this role. And then went on to be in Friends with Benefits with Mila Kunis, who was very much the girl at the moment in Hollywood. At this point in his career, Justin was used to making headlines all over the world, and in 2012 came the huge news that he and Jessica Biel were getting married. In 2012, Justin did um, what every girl didn't want him to do, which was propose to Jessica Biel in a mountaintop in Wyoming, and then kind of had quite a quick celebrity wedding to follow. He even sold the pictures to a magazine and, and put them out there for everybody to see. So you kind of got a glimpse into his personal life, which we've never really seen before and they just look so damn beautiful as well. Finally then, after months and years of speculation about Justin and Jessica, the world was wondering, look, is she the one? Have they found love? I think for all of those in the know in the industry, the talk was that Justin was an incredibly happy man. I mean, he was photographed everywhere with Jessica. They had moved in together. He was often socializing with her family and friends. And it was obvious that Jessica really was the one. I think after so many amounts of heartbreak during his private life, it was really nice to see Justin just walk down the aisle marry pretty much the hottest girl in Hollywood and just be happy. Cut to 2012 and their wedding photographs, the most lavish, beautiful Hollywood wedding you would expect, were one of the most sought after photographs for tabloids and magazines around the world. Everybody wanted the shot of Justin and Jessica and eventually they released them to the media and they were splashed around the world. After his marriage to Jessica Biel, Justin was back in the studio to record his third solo album, The 2020 Experience, which included the hugely popular single, Mirrors.
I think Mirrors was definitely the standout track on the 2020 experience. Uh, supposedly it was written about Jessica Biel. The video was brilliant, the song was huge on radio, straight to the top of the Billboard charts in the US. And it's definitely, you know, your typical Justin track that's going to be there for years and years. I actually think Mirrors is one of Justin Timberlake's greatest pop singles today. It's actually my favourite track on the 2020 Experience album. There was something special about Mirrors. It was a more anthemic pop R&B sound and it was obvious that this was the sound of a new Justin Timberlake, a happily married man, documenting his relationship with Jessica Biel, talking about the love of his life. They were heartfelt lyrics and also, he came out with this incredible video which embraced couples in love, inspired apparently by the love of his own grandparents, which is why the video featured some elderly performers telling the story and it got nominated for several MTV VMA awards. And the song itself was another instant Justin Timberlake number one. The 2020 Experience was a hugely successful comeback album for Justin. It debuted at number one on the US Billboard 200 and went on to sell millions of copies all around the world. Justin came back with the 2020 Experience in 2013 and it was just the perfect return. You know, Mirrors was a huge track, Suit and Tie. He'd kind of worked with all of those R&B people and he brought Jay-Z on board this time. There were a lot of influences in the hip hop world. It obviously went to the top of the charts around the globe. Justin Timberlake had gone back into studio and was about to release a brand new album. We'd been waiting since 2007 for a brand new Justin Timberlake record. Justin had gone back into studio with his great friend and mentor, Timberland. Uh, the creative juices had been flowing well. So when we finally got the 2020 experience, led by the incredibly clever um, vibe and single, the lead track, Suits and Tie, with an incredibly stylish video. It put Justin Timberlake back at number one. The sound was fresh, the collaboration with Jay-Z was just a winner. The two of them obviously hit it off. There were more collaborations to come from Jay-Z and Justin. It went to number one in the UK. It debuted at number one in the American chart. And of course, it established Justin once again as one of the biggest recording stars in the world. At the 2013 VMA Awards, Justin won the Lifetime Achievement Award. It was recognition for his amazing career with NSYNC and as a huge solo artist. At the ceremony, he performed a medley of all his hits and quite simply stole the show. When Justin won the Lifetime Achievement Award at the 2013 VMAs, I think we really got to grips with who he is as a performer. It was hit after hit after hit. The dance moves were slick. You know, the audience was loving it. His voice was so on point. And he even had NSYNC come back for a brief moment. really you know he reflected on what he's achieved and as a pop artist he's kind of up there he's on his way to Michael Jacksonville you know he really is something that is going to be here for the rest of our lives this is a really uh, special video for me because it's a tribute to my grandparents um, 
Well, let's not get soft. We all have grandparents. No, um, <laughs> and now I'm gonna follow that up with, and um, you know, my, my grandfather actually passed away in December. And so um, I know that, I, I hope my grandmother's watching right now. Uh, this is for you, Granny. He was part of one of the biggest boy bands of all time and went on to become one of the biggest recording artists of the 21st century. Having achieved so much already throughout his career, what does the future hold for Justin Timberlake? So next up for Justin, we're gonna have uh, the full studio album. So it's the second part of the 2020 experience. That's obviously gonna do really, really well. There's already tracks floating around. Justin and Jessica are bound to start thinking about starting a family, and I think it's kind of what everyone wants. They wanna see him settle down. They wanna see those little babies with really big grins and goofy smiles. It's definitely all about family for him. I think it's safe to say whatever Justin Timberlake does, he's gonna be very, very successful.